Welcome to Mental Health News Radio. I'm your host, Kristen Sunanta Walker. Just what are we going to discuss? The intimacy that is mental health. Let's continue to make it as comfortable as discussing brain health or heart health. This show has been on the air for several years and we have amazing co hosts. And then we created a network of podcasters on mentalhealthnewsradionetwork.com, a place where every possible facet of mental well being can be talked about openly. My show, after several hundred interviews, the format is this intimate, deep, funny, touching, sometimes uncomfortable, but always vulnerable conversations with interesting people. The goal is to have you, our listening family, many of you who have become my good friends, feel as though you are listening in on private conversations. Thank you for tuning in and becoming part of this amazing journey with me and now with our network of podcasters. Just knowing this podcast might be helping any of you realize you are not alone on this journey called being a human being makes doing this podcast worth every second. Hi, everyone. Kristen here. We have two really great guests that were uh, referred to us by one of our other podcasts, our eating disorder podcast, and we'll give more information about that show at the end of this one. Today, we have Reed Connell and Deanna Linville with A Home Within, and we're going to talk a little bit about what it is they do and why they do it, but we'll start with you, Reed. Hi, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Absolutely. And Deanna, thank you for coming on the show, too. Excited to be here. Thanks for having us. So let's start with you, Reed. Tell us a little bit about your background. I see you're the executive director, but explain what a home within is and you know about your background getting you from where you started to here. Sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah, well, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite proud to serve as the executive director of a home within. Um, I uh, took that position on a permanent basis uh, in April, right in the kind of depths and midst of the pandemic, uh, but I had been serving as interim executive director for about six months before that. Uh, and I stepped into the interim role uh, from a role on the board. I was the chair of the board last okay. fall when our previous executive director stepped down. Um, I've served on the board for about three years, but I've been involved with the Home Within um, for closer to seven and uh, I'll talk just briefly about my own, my, what brought me to the work um, and then tell you a little more about A Home Within. But um, so I, I built my entire career working with young people in foster care. My, my first job out of college back in the late 90s uh, was working with young people in group homes uh, in Oakland, California, uh, where I'm from. And I continued to work directly with young people in foster care for about 12 years before I uh, went to the MSW program at UC Berkeley and transitioned to more of a, a policy orientation. Um, I was the executive director of a different nonprofit. It was an advocacy nonprofit during the last recession and then founded a consulting firm. And a Home Within was one of my very first clients um, as a consultant. Um, and I got to know I got to know our founder, Dr. Tony Heineman, then uh, about seven years ago. Yeah, so the, the windy road to get there. We'll get into more of that in a minute. Um, how about you, Deanna? Well, I um, have had kind of a windy path as well to get to a home within. I uh, definitely started out being very interested in working with adoptive families and my um, master's and and doctoral training as a couples and family therapist and um, did that work, worked in some group homes as well, just like Reed um, as some of my first jobs Uh, and then moved out to Oregon about 16 years ago and uh, have been part of the faculty and the couples and family therapy program at the U of O ever since. And one of our alumni uh, from our master's program at the U of O has been also working with a home within for quite some time, Dr. Sarah Lynn Ralph. She's also faculty at University of San Francisco. And she had let me know about the position that was open at a home within uh, back in April or so. And I started looking more deeply into the organization and finding out that it was a place that I wanted to be a part of and 
um, a group of people that I wanted to help to support because I believe in the mission of a home with them. So starting this organization, uh, tell let's tell everybody where you know where it's located. That always tells a lot, especially with a name like a home within. So where is this located? Sure. So so we we were founded uh, in the late '90s uh, in San Francisco. Our founder, Dr. Tony Heineman, was a, a clinician in private practice in San Francisco uh, and taught uh, as well, and had a really extensive network uh, of. Uh, kind of uh, skilled and mid-career um, therapists, many of whom were working either incidentally um, or in intentionally with young people uh, and adults who had a background in foster care. Um, and so founded in San Francisco, based now uh, still in the Bay Area, we had an office. We're actually just giving up our office because uh, in COVID times, uh, right. Don't have much use for a lot it. of teletherapy, I'm sure. <laughs> Absolutely right. Um, so we're we are giving up our office in Oakland um, and uh, operating from home. So I'm here in San Francisco. Most of our staff uh, are here in California, and then Deanna is up in Oregon. But you know, our structure is really that we are a chapter-based volunteer program. So right now we have 19 chapters in 10 states and a total of about 275 active volunteer therapists um, and uh, another maybe 400 um, that have been recent uh, volunteers uh, or are waiting to be matched. Uh, so we're this network of volunteer clinicians in private practice nationwide, all of whom um, you know, come to a home within because they are willing to commit to seeing a, uh, a young person or a young adult with a, a background in foster care on a pro bono basis. Uh, and we say for as long as it takes. Um, so many of our, our matches last for quite, quite some time. Uh, our evaluator has found um, that the average match lasts for about three and a half years, but we have many that, that last for 10 or more. Um, and I can go a little more into our structure, but so we're, we're based in San Francisco, but we have 19 chapters nationwide. Wow. And has it, how interesting has it been to see this grow? I mean, things like this are uh, labors of love, 100% labors of love. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it was really, it was really a, a an impulse to um, you know change the world and uh, you know reach out and and try and uh, provide a support to individual young people one at a time, one clinician uh, and one youth for as long as it takes, and uh, really change the world by by helping one person at a time. And uh, that was really a kind of a compelling proposition to uh, volunteers all over the country. Um, so the growth of the network, it really started, Dr. Heinemann is um, you know, quite well recognized in um, the field, particularly for her work around trauma. Uh, and so she was uh, able to reach out uh, over time to her network kind of nationwide and identify you know, kind of leading, leading therapists and clinicians in the field who were interested in helping to found uh, a local chapter. Uh, and so, you know, pre-COVID, um, right. these were right. in-person networks, right? Um, and they were, uh, they had a strong geographic identity. Um, and, you know, it was often networks of clinicians in the same, in the same geographic area that shared um, professional networks. Um, now, as we adjust to COVID, we realize, of course, that we can build uh, community and build network over, you know, quite vast geographic dis distances. Right, exactly. How difficult was the transition from, uh, you know, offline with some online to everything's online and, so know, it, and, and, a, and at a rapid pace? <laughs> sure. Well, it was quite rapid. Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, it was it was astoundingly quick and successful. Good. Um, I think largely because our volunteers are in private practice, of course, they had to transition their entire private practice yep. uh, to therapy, kind of whether they wanted to or not, um, very, very <laughs> quickly uh, when shelter in place came down. Um, and so while many in our community, you know, I think have a natural kind of preference and are very grounded in, of course, face to face, um, you know, whether office or at the Starbucks or whatever, but face to face sessions, um, you know, kind of when faced with the realities of the shelter in place order, they, they adapted very quickly. And um, as far as we know, not a single one of our cases uh, uh, nationwide was, uh, you know, interrupted or terminated in that trend. We didn't lose anybody. Um, I love what you, you know, what's part of your mission about, um, well, I'll just read to the listeners what it says. 
for foster youth who often watch people move in and out of their lives, our model creates an anchor of support. So that one person staying with the same foster youth, that's so huge. I mean, it's unbelievably huge, as you know, but I don't know. You know, I don't understand if you don't mind explaining, maybe not every listener understands why that piece is so important to someone who's in the foster system. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, I'll take that one um, because I think one of the things I wanted to say based on your last question too, Kristen, is that uh, I think that the pandemic and having to go completely virtual has also allowed for some new opportunities for building community within our national network. And the way that I see this organization um, is that the mission is really there at the at every level. So the team, you know, the staff are are building a community and supporting each other um, in whatever way is necessary. And then, you know, I'm trying to build a community with the clinical directors and the consultation group leaders so that they feel like they have a community and we can do that more easily right now because we can all meet virtually. Um, and then so that the consultation group leaders are also feeling supported while they support their consultation groups of therapists who then are supporting these uh, foster, former and current foster youth who really have, you know, experienced by the time they, you know, come into foster care and maybe transition out, many disrupted relationships and attachments and having a stable, reliable person that they can trust that the, is there with them is trained to help them with any you know mental health issues that might come up relational issues that might come up through thick and thin and then you know being able to enter that relationship without necessarily knowing the outcome or knowing when that relationship will end and that is just so valuable for these these people that have been, you know, just let down so many times and abandoned, neglected, abused, um, but mostly just not had, so, you know, people that are consistently and reliably there for them. Talk a little bit, you know, you say former clients or so talk a little bit about that transition when someone there's always a big deal when someone ages out of quote unquote the system and then all of a sudden shoot your support's gone. So how do you handle that with the organization that you've got? Right. Well, I think that's one of the things that is so meaningful to me about a home within is that we're very specifically providing pro bono therapy for as long as it takes to former and current foster youth. So I remember when I was interviewing for the position and, um, with Reed, and he was telling me that a uh, recently a 50 year old person had just called and asked to be matched with a home within therapist, um, had not experienced, had never been in therapy before, and um, had been in the foster care system as a youth. And so I think that's something that is just really unique about this organization is that it doesn't really matter when someone is deciding, hey, I need a little extra support or for how long they need it, they're gonna get it with a home with it. Yeah, I would just add, you know, I mean, I think instability and disrupted relationships are unfortunately not only a part of the circumstances that bring young people into foster care, but they're very often a feature of the foster care experience itself. Yes. The young people, particularly those who spend a long time and particularly adolescents, they move between, of course, what we call placements in foster care. So that might be living with one foster family for a while and then moving to a different one or moving to a treatment setting or a congregate care facility, um, either because something happens or um, because they uh, you know, need additional support. And, you know, the result is that young people bounce around a lot. And every time they bounce around in foster care, their relationships are disrupted. And that includes relationships with uh, oftentimes a, a therapist if they are fortunate enough to connect with one. Um, 
through the system, it's often um, very much kind of attached to the specificity of their particular living situation at the time. And so if they move, they might lose their therapist. And then as you point out, when they turn 18 uh, or 21 now, many states have extended foster care to 21, then the publicly funded system um, is essentially done with them. There's transition planning and there are good faith attempts to set them up with connections to resources outside of the system, but oftentimes it is a pretty stark cliff. Now, the home within therapists are not actually part of that system. They're not part of the foster care system. They're individuals in private practice, and they connect with young people separately from, um, you know, those relationships that are kind of mediated by the, by the foster care system itself. And so a relationship with a home within therapist can, can transcend, it can sustain through a change in placement, a change in living situation. Maybe a young person is able to reunify with their family and go home um, either to their parents' home or to an extended family member, and that a home within therapist can remain consistent. And then certainly when they age out, that makes no difference to us. <laughs> Our volunteers stick right. with them across that time. That's uh, the key. That is the glue uh, right there. Just knowing that, oh, because they're already hearing through other systems that they're working with, as well as your organization, um, you're going to age out, you need to prepare. So knowing that there is one piece that's going to stay there with it, all this other stuff going away is huge. Right, mm -hmm. right. And then as Deanna points out, some some young people, maybe maybe they at a certain point in their early adulthood, they feel like they don't need therapy anymore, or maybe they just lose track of their um, their therapist or their network. Um, and if they if they come back to us, um, we're absolutely willing to help out um, in whatever way we can. So we do have young adults and some not so young adults um, who come back to us when they um, when they when they need more support, um, and we're we're happy to provide that. Um, I don't know of any other. Um, you know, kind of provision of any other mental health service or uh, available support like this um, that's available for so broad a right. uh, you know population of, of people. So how often, and you don't have to answer this, but I, I, this is less of a question and more of a statement. I wonder how often it is that you have kids that go through your program and they decide this is the career they want for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so I could just tell you from, from personal experience uh, <laughs> quite often, um, you know. I, I would imagine my safe place is now going to become my career. Yeah. Yeah. I actually am in touch with a young woman who I knew when she was about 13, 15, 13 to 15 years old. She was in a transitional housing program that I staffed many years ago before I went to graduate school. And she reconnected with me when I took this job because she said, hey, I got my therapist from a home with, and I don't know you were leading that organization. That's amazing. I asked her what she's doing. Well, she just finished her MSW program and she's pursuing <laughs> her licensure hours uh, at, a, at a clinic um, in East Oakland, which happens to be uh, where she and I both grew up. So we had that in common from the beginning. Um, I love it. I love it. You, now involved with the organization. you help teach people to live uh, a life of service and advocacy. That's fantastic. That's, that's, that's what makes it the rewarding career. I want to ask both of you, I'll start with you, Reed, why this career for you? Oh, for me? Um, you know, honestly, I, um, I wish I could say, it's funny, I, I'll, I'll just say this even on the radio. Um, but, you know, I wish I could say that I made a very conscientious <laughs> choice based on a study of, you know, my deep personal interests and my, um, you know, commitment to social justice. I certainly uh, had an orientation towards, um, you know, uh, uh, doing good work in the community. I had um, founded a, an adult literacy program when I was an undergrad and uh, worked with immigrants and refugees um, and so on. Um, but I had barely even heard of foster care when I took my first job in the foster care system. Um, I, had a, I had a roommate um, who was working um, for an organization in Oakland um, that uh, provided very high quality um, foster care uh, placements and therapeutic services. And uh, she, she told me it was, it was a good job um, mm -hmm. with good benefits and good schedule and flexibility. <laughs> and um, so I, I, I tried it out, but um, I tell you, you know, within, I don't know, probably six or nine months, I knew that that was where I was going to build my career. Uh, I knew that I wanted to work with young people in foster care, that I wanted to think about and try to understand trauma and the many ways that it plays out over time. Um, 
And so, yeah, like I said, for about 12 years, I worked directly with young people in a variety of settings. And um, as I, I worked in the group home for a while, but then I worked in non-public schools. I worked in the homes of families that were trying to reunify. I worked in the homes, uh, in foster homes, providing uh, coaching uh, to parents on how to intervene in, in behavior and mental health issues. Um, and every time I kind of got a different angle on the system, I kind of got more committed to uh, taking a role um, that would have, you know, kind of a structural impact. Um, okay. So that, that brought me here eventually. Well, I'm glad you're there. And Deanna, I want to ask you the same question. Why does this work for you? <laughs> Well, I mean, I the simple answer and the quick one is that I have known since I was probably about eight or nine years old that I wanted to be a helper. I didn't necessarily conceptualize it as a family therapist necessarily. Um, and then, you know, in high school, I was, you know, peer facilitator and always one of the people that was trying to make sure everyone felt like they belonged and were cared about. And I kind of became, you know, even I remember the guidance counselor at my high school getting me out of class so that I could quote counsel <laughs> my peers <laughs> and, you know, responding to emergencies and um, realizing that, gosh, you know, I, I have a natural talent for this or a gift for this, but I also really could use some training. Right. Um, and maybe even to grow up a little bit. And um, so I knew from a pretty young age that I wanted to be a therapist. Um, it was experiences in with family therapy that made me realize that that was the best fit um, in terms of mental health fields, um, just because of it fitting with my worldview and that, you know, behaviors and even mental health symptoms, they make sense given the context that they're in um, right. and that relationships have an, a huge, a massive influence on um, everyone's well-being and how they feel about themselves and how they learn about themselves. And so that field in particular just being a, a good fit for me. It can be really difficult to turn it off. I know i um, being a kid that had a lot of childhood trauma and early, you know, at 12, I'm in heavy duty therapy. It made it, I mean, I became like a, a laser with people. Oh, these are their issues. It became really hard not to. And there were times that I would ask completely intrusive, you know, uh, questions because <laughs> you just don't think about it. That's part of your world. So um, I, I bring this up because I've, I've had a couple of people that are interested in getting into the field ask me that. How do I turn that off? And you two are veterans mm -hmm. in the field. So, Deanna, I'll start with you. How do you sort of temper that in your life outside of mental health? Well, I will be perfectly honest, which might not, and I tell this to my students and my supervisees all the time. Um, I learned about two years into my master's uh, clinical training program that I probably should not do therapy full time. And that is because I care a lot and I'm, you know, maybe highly empathetic and sensitive, which are again, really good things, intuitive um, for this field. And it made it hard for me to find that work-life balance and um, to make sure I was finding time for myself to regroup and rejuvenate. And so I, you know, that's when I decided to uh, go on and get my doctorate degree so that I could um, have a combination of research teaching, supervision, and my own clinical work. And that balance between all of those uh, professional activities has been so helpful for me um, because I can kind of zoom out and zoom in. And when I'm getting to, um, you know, hyper-focus maybe on one family or that I'm trying to help, I can, you know, use my, put on my researcher hat and um, think about it more from a research perspective. And I find that all of the um, activities together really deepen what I'm able to do in each of them as well. Like they inform each other. Mm -hmm. That's great. that's how I've been able to keep it balanced and, you know, good self care and um, <laughs> trying to practice what I preach and all of that is of course 
important. Absolutely. How about you, Reed? Um, you know, for me, um, I think part of it, so I, I started that first job um, was at what I call kind of the very deep end of the system. So I worked in a program um, that um, provided, uh, you know, kind of uh, residential treatment to uh, some of the, the very most behaviorally disturbed and most traumatized children um, in the state of California. At the time, it was called a, a no eject, no reject program. So, um, you know, young people, there was nothing that young people could do to get kicked out. And they had been kicked out of many, many, many previous programs. Um, and so there was kind of a concentration effect. And I worked with uh, boys who were six to 13 who had been through the most just unimaginable abuse. Um, and at the time, again, I, I didn't really have a grounding in all of that. I hadn't thought very much about um, all the ways that, that those kinds of experiences um, were going to manifest in young people's lives. And at the beginning, it was, it was rough. Uh, you know, like I said, I had a, a roommate who, um, you know, had been doing the work for longer and um, she blessedly um, was made herself available to me to debrief after almost every shift for about my first six months. Um, <laughs> Thank God for those people, right? Where they, they just say no and they kind of shake their head and they help you through yeah. and you know that they're like, okay, what's it going to be today? You know, it's not yeah. going to be forever that you need to go to them, but the, you, right. boy, are they invaluable when you do. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, and so it was, it was, it was long and hard. I would say, like the first six or nine months, you know, there's yeah. you know, real questions, and there were all kinds of really troubling things that would go on in the program that you were um, exposed to as these as these children, you know, kind of manifested the long term impacts of their trauma. Um, and uh, but you know, at, at a certain point, if you're going to stick with it, you 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 figure out how to put it down at the end of the shift, and you figure out how to not let um, the kind of um, vicarious trauma color your own relationships and your own well-being. Uh, not everybody figures those things out. There's very high turnover in the field, particularly in those kinds of settings. Um, Absolutely. But if you do, then that's that's with you. That's a skill that you have. One thing I have to say, and you know, I don't know how uh, the, the whole audience of, of clinicians would think about this, but you know, I read the case files of my first group of young people very carefully. Um, it was something that, that we were kind of encouraged to do. And so I read these big binders that just mm -hmm. documented in absolute granular detail all of this horror that had been visited on these children. And I, I didn't really feel the need to do that in later years. I, I, you know, I knew what I needed to know, but I didn't really yeah. need to sink into the details. So especially when I worked with adolescents, I realized that all of that was perhaps helpful in some context, um, but that young people, you know, deserve the opportunity to define themselves. Uh, rather than having, you know, the, the worst things that ever happened to them documented in black and white and have me carrying that into my first interactions. With right, them. right. So that was another piece of it. It was just figuring out kind of like what I needed to know and what, what I didn't need to know in order to, you know, be available and be present and be helpful to young people. Mm. I wanted to add one thing, too, that I think was implied in uh, what you said, Reed, um, which is really the importance of community for therapists and that that is what that that is what helps people to kind of have those emotional boundaries to be able to um have resiliency in the field of uh therapy or mental health and so i think that's one of the really amazing things about a home within is that from the very beginning the way that the founders brought therapists into a home within is through consultation groups so people would want to be part of a home within because they knew and admired one of the consultation group leaders and then that built-in support has been i think vital for the organization but also vital for the therapist to you know um reduce burnout to have those emotional boundaries and to really be able to feel like they're supported as well yeah, absolutely. Peer support is huge, uh, no matter what type of an organization it is, but absolutely in, in this setting, because there are times where you go, you know, you're a highly empathic person, otherwise you really wouldn't do this work or at least stick with it for very long at all, and you are going to bleed, and then you're going to bleed out <laughs> if you don't learn how to, you know, 
mm-hmm. how to stop that bleeding. So having a peer listen is huge. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I would just say, you know, I think, so I mentioned that I, I joined on an interim basis. I was serving as the board chair and I decided that um, with the, the resignation of the, the previous exemption needed the stability that would be provided by somebody, you know, at that point I'd been on the board for three years and I'd been associated with the organization for seven. So I had the relationships um, to provide some stability in the transition. When I agreed to become the permanent executive director, um, it was because I was awed by the power of our community. So when I describe a home within to people, I say that it is a community of hundreds of therapists nationwide who volunteer to provide one-on-one therapy to current and former foster youth for as long as it takes. And of course, in the beginning of the pandemic, we were all under duress. Everybody was um, yeah. you know, stressed and was hurting and was reaching out and looking to connect. And I started doing open calls um, on Saturday mornings on Zoom um, and I had therapists from all over the country, from Northampton, Massachusetts, and Miami, and Chicago, and New York, and Los Angeles, and San Diego, and Portland, and Seattle, joining these calls, and really coming together and recognizing that their association and their service to a home within was, you know, enough of a point of commonality for them all to feel tremendously reassured and supported by one another almost reflexively, right? And then of course, as we get into it, everybody's having the same struggles with the transition to teletherapy and with just the kind of sheer um, terror and fear and anxiety that those early days of the pandemic provoked Um, and really watching and being a part of this community and seeing how it was sustaining people who again, have already dedicated their careers um, you know, to helping people. And, and I knew that they were providing an essential support for foster youth that I, you know, dedicated my career to, <laughs> you know, it was, so, it was such a compelling and powerful experience that, uh, you know, I was like, I, I'm ready to commit um, right. to this role and to leading this organization. Mm, well, I'm so glad for both of you that you are, we need more and more organizations like this everywhere. I'm sure you're a model for many. Um, on that note, can you tell us, Reed, can you go ahead and share with us where people can find out more about the organization? Sure. Now, and the best place is at our website, um, which is www.ahomewithin.org. Uh, and there, there's uh, all, all the information about what it is to volunteer with us, about the impact of our work, um, and then there's contact information for, for both me, Indiana, and anybody, uh, everybody else on staff. Um, so if folks are interested, they should get in touch. Absolutely. I feel like, you know, right now, people, you're at home more than you ever have been. If you're looking for, you know, this kind of volunteer work, there are ways because of us being at home that you can do volunteer work that you don't have to drive somewhere. So the old excuse of, I just don't have time, maybe that really doesn't fit anymore. So (laughs) if this feels right for you, please go to a homewithin.org and fill out the information. And I want to give a shout out to our amazing um, podcasters that do our eating disorder, eating disorders, navigating recovery podcast who referred me to the two of you. So it's a fantastic, fantastic show. And um, I want to say thank you to the two of you for coming on. Thank you so much for having us. And um, it was just a pleasure. You made it easy. (laughs) I've been doing this for eight years. I hope it's easy for people at this point. (laughs) I can tell. (laughs) All right. And thank you listeners for tuning in to another episode of Mental Health News Radio. Hi listeners, I'll make it quick. These are some really cool places that give discounts and other cool things for listeners of Mental Health News Radio Network. If you want to get amazing help with healing from narcissistic abuse, go to healfromanarcissist.com. If you want CBD products that are the best of the best, I use them myself, go to pros, P-R-O-Z-E dot com and use the code mentalhealth20, mentalhealth20. If you want to get daily perk ups that help retrain your brain to think more positively, go to perkupdaily.com. And also 
just because this one's fun. Snarkycandles.com. I guarantee you'll love them. Snarky with a Y, S-N-A-R-K-Y, candles.com. And don't forget, if you want to hear all the shows on the network about first responders, you can go to firstrespondermentalhealthnetwork.com and all of our shows that focus on narcissistic abuse, narcissisticabusehealingnetwork.com. Thanks for listening and back to the show. But never without good intentions I heat up and act on my emotions Thanks so much for listening to Mental Health News Radio. Our podcast can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, and hundreds of other podcast apps. Or you can visit our website at mentalhealthnewsradio.com. If you have a question or would like to be a guest, become a podcaster on our network, or join the amazing organizations that help keep us on the air, please email us at info at mhnrnetwork.com. Get ready for that special goodbye from our resident therapy dog, Miles, and a special thanks to Emily Sohn for letting us use her incredible song, Cordial, for our podcast music. Listen to the full song on SoundCloud at emily.sonne. Don't be surprised when I don't hate on you. After all we promised, we'd be cordial. Sometimes in you, I can fight. Good boy.